God, Heavenly Father, we worship you and we thank you for the way you pour out your love, your energy, your joy, your peace, and your comfort on your children today, Lord God. I ask as we get ready here on Sunday, the head of the week, to walk into the rest of our days, that the words of the songs we sung and the praises we gave and the knowledge and verses that we have chewed on will dwell richly in our spirit and be that extra shield, that fortification, that unction that we need to now tackle whatever it is that life has in front of us for these next several days, Lord God. I ask that you will be with me with words to fortify your people, Lord, so that we can get ever closer, ever sharper, ever stronger in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as has been mentioned a couple times, it's getting close to that Valentine's Day season, and perhaps the, the mind is dwelling on things of love, and I was thinking, huh, I'd, I'd like to do a, do a little message on love, but that's easier said than done, because if you think about it, the word love is one of the most used and abused words in our English vocabulary, is it not? We... We use the term love to justify doing maybe selfish things for ourselves. We use the idea of loving this one to maybe step on or hurt someone else that we used to love or we said we loved or I don't love this one as much as that one so I do this to this and I do all this confusion surrounding that tiny little four-letter word, love. As I was thinking about that, I was wondering, with all these misconceptions and, and counterfeits of love in the world, what on earth must the world think when they hear in the church, oh, God is love? We say that phrase, but if they don't know what love is, they can't really understand when we say that to them. Or they might be thinking something completely different than what the word of God itself says. Or sometimes I wonder, what do Christians envision when we remember the verse, love our enemies as ourself, when we're not always necessarily loving ourself or our families the way in which we should? It limits the way that we can apply it now to our enemies and that extra circle of people who are supposed to still be getting that love. What is going on with love these days? I resonate very deeply with when Paul says in the New Testament how all of the knowledge and all of the words and all of the things he's doing are useless if he doesn't have love. So my message for you today is titled, Motivated by Love. But because that self-sacrificial love of God gets so distorted in our culture, generation after generation, I was thinking, let's discuss some, some concepts in the word regarding loving our communities, loving the outsider, and loving God. So those are, those are, if you look at your family, look at everything, there's an inner bubble, there's everyone outside of the bubble, and then there's God himself. So between those three categories, we have the whole world and universe covered. So a big plan, but I think we can do that in about 15 minutes, right? So I, for each one of those sections, I would like to bring to your attention a verse that I feel sort of sums up that idea. So for our first verse today, let's look at John chapter 13, verse 25. And we'll do a little bit of flipping in your Bibles if you have it. It's good for you to keep practicing, keep those uh, fingers sharp like sword drills you used to do when you were kids. So if you're at John 13, 35, Jesus is telling his, uh, the people that he's with at that time, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Very simple concept. Uh, in fact, when Jesus Christ was 
praying for the sustenance of his disciples, he prays that they will be united and that they will be one, just like how he and the Father are one. In fact, when Jesus Christ was praying these words, he was praying it not only for the disciples he was casting his eyes on right then, but also the next generation and the next generation and the next generations of disciples that will hear the word and continue. His prayer is that we would be distinct from the rest of the community and the rest of society by the way we visibly demonstrate our treatment towards each other. Also everyone else, right? But it's a special love for the fellow uh, Christians, your brothers and sisters in the community of Christ. And I think why Jesus was so adamant about praying for unity, because to get people of different ideas and different personalities and different styles to be unified, that really is a miracle, isn't it? So to the world, it is sort of a, an unnatural state. It's sort of a, a rarity. We know that unity brings light into a situation. Not only does it stand as contrast from the divisions, factions, and arguments that we see in the world around us, so it hints, oh, these Christians are a little bit different. But in our graciousness and love towards one another, we become a fragrance that is more winsome to the outside world. Because when you're in darkness and you are missing the love of God, any little glimmer of love that I see in your face or in your arms or the way that you treat your family, that becomes a magnet that draws people to you. So unity brings light. Unity brings peace. We know how the word says how good it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. But the reality of it, unity also brings friction, right? If we were all home in our, in our respective beds, we would have no opportunity to accidentally step on one another's toes or to jostle someone just a little bit too harshly or to say a word just a little bit too curtly. Now, the Lord envisions his people to gather like, are we, are, like we are doing now, and he wants his, his people, all of his children, to find a church to connect to. But many people who have fallen away from the house of God will say things like, oh, well, uh, I was hurt in church, or oh, it's difficult there, or those people are this, or those people are that. But a measure of that is going to be true wherever you go. Because when you have people, you will occasionally, actually, you are guaranteed to at some point have those conflicts. So here is my word of advice. So whenever uh, a loved one who you see kind of pulling away from the body of Christ or when you yourself are tempted to pull away from the body of Christ because of that natural friction that could occasionally occur, as far as you can release, you are free. Or I can say this another way. You are free to the extent that you can release sort of the discomfort, the anger, the offense that comes with living in community with those in your life. This can be your church family. This can be your siblings who drive you crazy. This can be your work community, whatever that bubble is. Because the enemy has a plan for bondage. And he has a plan to break up the community that God has ordained. So we know that unforgiveness tends to breed bitterness, right? And tends to breed oppression. But I postulate, so I have a little theory here that it's not stemming simply from anger, right? Because if you're angry, and you realize, oh, maybe I overreacted, or maybe she didn't mean it that way, doesn't our anger subside pretty quickly? So it's, it's not 
anger itself that breaks up unity. In fact, we know that because in Ephesians, the word reminds us, you know, it says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. So that indicates that there is some sort of separation between the emotional feeling of anger and the sinful mentality that leads to the enemy's bondage. And I want to present to you that that, rather than anger, is the term offense. Let me explain the difference between these two things. When someone has offended you, or when an offense has come about, the th you still might feel angered, right? But the source of that anger is justified. That's a weird thing to say. When you are offended because what you have a good reason to be angry, it is when you have that good reason to be angry is when our hearts resist forgiveness. And in fact, that is the very bait of Satan. Because if the devil knows that humans won't forgive if they have a really solid, a really rational, very legitimate justification for the way they are feeling, he will make sure you find that good reason. That's what makes it bait. Think about uh, all the fish that have been hooked and caught over the course of time, right? How do you think you can possibly persuade a happy, simple fish going their own way to jab a jagged metal piece, a foreign object, into its body and to be torn from his home. You have to put something really, really, really good on the end of that hook. So the danger is not mistaken friction or mistaken conflict. Because the enemy knows here today, gone tomorrow. That's not the bait. The issue is when really did happen the way that you think it did, or this person really did misunderstand. And we shouldn't be surprised that the devil operates this way. You see, the term Satan, we know, means the accuser, right? And oftentimes when we have prayers of deliverance or speaking over the people, you might hear phrases, you know, if you've been in a charismatic Pentecostal church long enough, you hear something like, ah, sister, you don't want to give the devil a legal right, right, into your situation. Uh, a legal right, meaning an actual justification, uh, or a door that you've allowed the enemy to come into. I'll give you some silly quick examples. We know not everyone who smokes gets cancer, right? Some people smoke get cancer, but you see that one person living 50 years, smoking a pack a day, about half the people who smoke get cancer, right? But if you're a Christian born washed in the blood, and you are tearing down the enemy's stronghold, and you give the enemy an in, don't you think he's going to do everything he can to make sure you're one of that 50%? Yeah, right. So, in that's a situation where we're doing something, not necessarily bad or evil, but it allows a physical way for the enemy to come in, and because you're a child of God, and the enemy wants to destroy you, he takes advantage of his legal right in that situation to manipulate take a mile for the inch that you gave him. Same thing with our relationships. Even though they're not physical, you can't see, taste, and touch them the way you can with other doors that we open, the enemy, that roaring lion, is just waiting, waiting for that opportunity to come in and break up that new friendship that you found or to make you doubt your sister or your brother's intention with you, or to make you feel that the work that you're doing in church really doesn't matter. And there might be a little bit of truth in all of that, but it's not the full picture because the enemy will manipulate and magnify to break us down. So, with knowledge is power, right? I went on that little soapbox, so this is something me and my mom have been dis discussing and thinking like, ooh, we're starting to see this is how the devil operates in this, and this is how he breaks up unity. And it, if the people only knew, we could be on guard, right? 
We know the word tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. But trust in God releases us from the burden of having to enact our own justice with every problem, conflict, or offense that comes our way. Let me explain that a little bit. So the angry soul protests in a situation because one of two things, I think, right? You protest in anger when something that has happened to you, you feel has gone unseen. No one notices. They don't know the full gravity of the situation. Or if the person you're protesting to has seen it and knows about it, it's either going unaddressed or not properly punished or, or given its due season. That's when the offense rise up in us. It wasn't seen, so we want everyone to know what happened, or they saw it, but they don't know how bad it was, and I need them to know. I have felt that way. That was the time when anger went on for years and years and years, and like a fine wine turning into vinegar turns into bitterness instead. Child of God, does our God, who is our defender, not see the various offenses and situations that happen to us? Does our God, is he not just? Is he not concerned also as much as you are for the sin that you might be observing that makes you upset? You see, it's a little bit of a lack of confidence in God seeing the situation that makes us demand for it to be seen. And there's a little bit of a lack of confidence in how God is handling the situation that drives us to want to handle it our own way. But put yourself in God's shoes for just a second, right? We have many parents here. I'm not a parent. I have cats. Like, I'll try to throw them into the story. But <laughs> I know we have a lot of moms and dads here, right? Or spiritual moms and dads. So let's uh, story time for a little bit, a little image. Let's pretend you have two beautiful, wonderful children. They're not perfect, but they do what they're told, you know, some of the times. Now, your first child, Mike Stand, well, he was doing something he shouldn't do. You know the situation, and you're planning to correct Mike. And you're, you're planning to, to intervene or punish or coach or whatever you're going to do. But before you have the opportunity to follow through, your second child, Aquafina, takes it upon herself to beat the daylight out of Mike. Now, these are your two kids. Honestly, what do you do in that situation? Do you go and say, yes, Aquafina, you're totally right, and join her and starts beating the child? No, you don't. Because although what he did was one problem, what she's doing is now a whole new problem in this situation. In fact, what Aquafina doesn't know, by her taking it into her own hands and beating up on her brother, now God's like, he got enough licks as it is. Now the only one left I have to spank is you. Now you end up getting tied up into a mix of something that originally you never did. It was never your wrong. Don't get dragged into someone else's spanx <laughs> by volunteering some of our own punishment. Because we, because at the end, they're both your children, right? You love them both. You want the best for both of them. And we are those children. As the child, we have to trust that our father actually knows what he's doing. We have to trust that when he fixes it, he's going to fix it for good and he's going to fix it right. And that brings so much relief. It's a weight off your shoulders. And I'm learning that that's actually what forgiveness is. It's not that I don't see what Mikey Mike is doing. It's not that I don't disagree. It's, it's not that I don't have a perspective on the situation, but I take him off of my hook, knowing that as a human, I don't want to join in on his sin, but that I don't know the full picture or have the full power to follow through and give it up to the Lord is still going to get spanked. So I, I can sleep at night, but I don't have to be the one doing it. <laughs> I don't have to be the one maybe making the situation uh, worse. Just think of how you would for your kids. 
All right. So that's a little bit of acting out ways that we can love each other when, when working in community, being patient, letting go of our anger, but also letting go of the offenses, even the really good ones. If we see, it threatens the body of Christ. In fact, Paul says, I didn't even write the verse down, so you have to find it for me. He talks about uh, living at peace with all men and why not, uh, why not rather be wronged? Like, if it's a choice between him being right and destroying someone or him being right and no one knows and this person goes on in the wrong way, he would rather be wrong just to, like, preserve what's going on. Now, I'm not there yet. I have to say my opinion. I have to say why it's wrong and how it's wrong and what I can do. I mean, we're all working on this together. But if we can just be a little less taking the role, uh, the controlling role, and putting it in God's hands, then we can still correct one another, and we can still inform one another. But there is no burden of follow-through on our shoulders, because if they're a child of God, God's going to spank you, he's going to spank you, and I will, and I'll just let that happen. And it makes it easier, and you can go to church and not think everyone's hypocrites, (laughs) and sit here and be happy. All right, but what about if they're not, you know, part of your family, right? What if they're not one of our church family and they don't have that understanding of uh, right and wrong and what God does? Like a lot of uh, scripture, how God says he's going to take care of his sheep, it applies to us. What if they're not sheep? What about the goats? What about the goats that are biting me? How do, how do I respond to this? So that's going to bring us to our second topic, how to love the outsider. For that, we are going to go back to an old prophecy in Isaiah, or Isaiah. Elisha, if you can put that verse on the board for me, it's uh, Isaiah 42, verse 3. And I want you guys to look at that verse, and you tell me what this means. All right, can you guys see it? A bruised reed, he will not break. And now this is prophecy of Jesus Christ, like this king coming to like usher in their people into glory. But a lot of times you have that uh, where you can still make an application for yourself because if this is how our savior is supposed to behave when ushering in his people and our savior is our model, we we can appropriate that internally ourselves. So a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Is he talking about furniture? What is this verse talking about? What do you think? Oh, talking about people. Who's the, who's the people? The outsider is the snuff? Is the wick? What's the outsider? Mm. The smoldering wick. The bruised reed. That represents the people in our lives, how do I say it, Uh, that are damaged or that are are already like halfway gone. And if you think about it, what are the lost among us or the lost people of the world in the grand scheme of things? They're on their way to hell. They're, they're being crushed by baggage and, and bondage, and the enemy has got their mentality twisted and tied up probably for as long as they've been thinking they might be thinking wrong. In a way, any lost person, particularly when their thinking is totally off and you can see that their wrong actions coming from their wrong mentality and the wrong mentality coming from the fact that they don't have Christ in their life and the Holy Spirit to guide them, they are that bruised wick that bruised weed, or reed, and that smoldering wick. Now, in my house, if I light a candle and the wick is smoldering and it's making smoke and it's stinging my eyes and it's, and it's an unpleasant, uh, obnoxious presence in my house, I put it out. I, the first thing I do, whoop, put it in the water or take that last little bit and, and snuff it out. But what... Our Father is showing us that the, that the destiny of not only when Christ came to the earth, but us as followers of Christ, 
is not to smolder out the wicks as much as they stink, as much as they burn, but is to somehow redeem or restore, or that you can deal with a reed that's bruised. You can deal with it. You can talk to it. You can lean it upright, but in such a way that you don't accidentally snap that last little piece that they have holding on. There's, uh, we all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that none should perish but have everlasting life, so on and so forth. We all can record that, say that pretty quick. How about the next verse, John 3.16? Who knows that one? Who can recite that one? Ah, some of you can. (laughs) Good for you. But you know what? Most people stop at 16, don't they? They stop at 16. They forget what 17 says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, I want to give an example of condemning versus saving. Because I am someone, I like to get information. I like to tell the truth. I want you to tell me the truth. So if I'm doing something wrong, tell me. But, but let's, let's try to cut the line between saving and condemning. Okay, you're on land, or there was a ship that sank. You are safely in the harbor, or you're on the dock, and you're watching other people still in the bad situation in their lifeboat, and this lifeboat is sinking. They are going the rate they're going. They are never going to make it to the shore. They're taking on more water. They are in a perilous situation. Maybe they notice. Maybe they don't. But from your perspective, you can easily see what's going on. Here's what I say, uh, what condemning might be in that situation. Hey, your lifeboat is sinking. You're not going to make it. Okay, that's true. Here's what's saving. Seeing the situation maybe explaining what's going on, but then now taking some time to grab their hand or to throw out a rope to actually bring them back in. You see, condemning's intent is kind of just to, I don't want to say just to point out, because you can point out something with not condemning, but condemning is like a a prediction of futility. Like, it's not just, oh, your boat is sinking. You need to plug it up. It's like, your boat is sinking. There is no way you're going to make it. Oh, there's no way that God's going to do this. There's no way that God's going to do that. It's the, it's the effect that you're predicting and speaking over their life, which is also another kind of bondage, another little verbal or word chain that we throw upon their heavy shoulders already. And it's true, they may not know, and if they don't know the situation they're in, they can't get out of it. So I do believe that saving oftentimes does involve that conversation, but the but the the goal, the the main crux of saving is the doing, is the intervening and changing the situation, or maybe trying to persuade them to come from their shaky boat and instead jump onto your solid dock. We can do that, by the way, by showing our love and unity, showing how our lives are different when we lose someone or when our job is lost or when things fall apart. Everything on the outside looks like it does for the one perishing in the world, but on the inside, we are still solid and strong, and everyone is looking, how can she go through that and not look like me? What's different? That's a little bit of saving or if it's the counseling, or if it's the extolling, or talking to someone and praying over them and and bringing them in, that's all part of the saving. But Romans 15, verses 1 and 2, reminds us that we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, not just to please ourselves, but each of us to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. This is part of the discussion that me and mom have. Uh, Every now and then, you might have an interaction or a conversation with someone that you thought was going to be saving or you thought was going to be really profitable, and it did not go the way that you planned. And it seems like, whoops, I made the situation much worse. Or Or they were here, and now they're upset, and now they're even farther. I know that Jesus came to save the world and not condemn the world, but every now and then, when I look at the results, I'm like, dang it, what side am I on? <laughs> who, who are we working for? 
And so with mean mom, what we try to do is we try to look at, okay, in these scenarios, we thought we did or said the right thing, but what was the result? And if the result doesn't lend, land me in Camp Jesus or bring them a little bit closer, then she and I would acknowledge like, okay, maybe didn't do that 100% the way that we did uh, or uh, wasn't 100% the best, what do they call it in the army, uh, friendly fire, right? You, you took a couple shots for the, for the, for the wrong team. So that, that happens. But we have to remember that at the end of the day, it is the soul that is our biggest concern. There's a young man mom and I are praying for. He has some great qualities, have some, you know, wishy-washy qualities. And for the longest time, we are praying either for him to straighten up or get out. <laughs> straighten up or take yourself out of the situation because you cannot handle the pressure of the situation. And it was just recently that we were thinking, oh, well, Lord God, if we're praying so hard, how can the situation still be this way? And then we realized if we have a good God that hears our prayer, and if we have a good God that loves this person, is working things out for the person, and we're working so hard and praying and trying to be supportive as we can, even though we're not always seeing the fruit of our efforts and our prayers and results, we have to be convinced in our minds that we are still doing the right thing and that God is still faithful to walk that person through. Have you guys heard that illustration of trying to grow bamboo? You know, bamboo is known for growing meters. Meters, feet in the course, like you can watch it grow a couple inches in a day and in a week, meters, meters, meters. But it doesn't start that way. If you go home, cut a little piece of bamboo, stick it in a pot, it'll grow. And you'll have to come twice a day with your little cup of water and water it. One week, month, year, two years, three years. Is this, is this thing even still alive? Nothing is, nothing is changing. I don't see a sprout. I don't see a bud. I don't see a leaf. This is a waste of my water bill. What's going on here? Turns out this particular species of bamboo can take up to seven years when replanted, growing just its roots. But once it completes the growth of its roots, it, becomes an, it goes into a new stage of development where now it's shooting up out of the ground. All this time we thought we were watering a dead stump, but what we didn't know, there was growth. There was something happening underneath the surface. We just have to change our perspective sometimes when looking at people. There is a baby Christian who I, uh, uh, we got to know each other at the college where I used to work. And when I met this girl, oh my goodness, she was crazy. She wasn't a Christian then. She was, you know, you've heard the term hot mess. So she, she would call herself like, ah, my life's a hot mess. And she was right. Uh, I met this girl. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about, Sister Hiawatha. You know when you meet those people. Like, she's a hot mess and she knows it. Uh, a few years later, I go out to lunch with this girl to hang out with her, and she seems completely different. Now, some of the things that she says that are off back five, ten years ago, she still was saying some of that, but there's something I can't put my finger on. And through the course of the conversation, I sneak in, hey, do, do you know Jesus now? And she's like, yes, I accepted Christ and blah, 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 blah. And she never had to say a word, but there was this change, right? So that's stage one to stage two. Now me and her, she's back in the state. We're buddies. We're hanging out. We're doing things. And every now and then, this cutesy baby Christian, like every baby does, says some wild outlandish thought that popped into her head, and she thinks it's right. My instincts is, uh, oh, no, she's doomed. Uh, but I don't say that because I was convinced from that first meeting that something had changed, that there was the Holy Spirit in her now, that even though she knew some things before, she was dead on the inside. Now she knows about the same but is alive in the inside. 
So when I have these conversations with her, I give a little correction and I give a lot of encouragement and I am fully persuaded that God is able to keep that which has been committed to him against that day. This weird little crazy girl that would say these crazy statements, crying really hard to quote the Bible, she could have gone either way, but with a little patience and also giving them a little room to sort of grow and make some mistakes, as you talk to her more and more and more, you would never know now the things she's come from and the things that happened to her that sort of brought her down this path. I can tell you for a fact that up until me hanging out with this girl, I did not understand this concept at all. But now I can see that once you see that, I know, we can't see the roots, right? But if you see one little sprout and one little change and you can tell it's breathed from the Holy Spirit, you can now have the confidence that this dead plant really is alive. And if I just don't break it, <laughs> if I just don't pull it out by mistake, if I just don't pluck it up, she's going to keep growing. So I've had this mindset set shift and I'm thinking oh maybe we all can benefit from knowing that I promise God is still building the roots underneath the surface long before you can see it it makes it easier to bear with their weaknesses right it makes it easier to to sort of like okay honey that's not what that verse meant let's read it again without getting too tense about the situation and my last my last little example we talked a little bit about loving our communities, and we talked a little bit of how best to love that outsider. How now can we apply this in the way we love the Lord, right? Uh, the word says, those that love me will obey my word. So we know obedience is part of that. But I was thinking about Peter. After Peter had betrayed Jesus, and he saw Christ again, he was so desperate to sort of endear himself again or to redeem himself after what he did. And Jesus would ask him, Peter, do you love me? Why, of course I do, my Lord. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then water my flocks. I might be mis- uh, quoting the little phrase here or there, but every answer was, if you love me, take care of my babies. If you love me, look after the thing that you see me working hard on. And let me give you a little story. My dad told me when he was a kid growing up, he was the youngest of six, but his father had a lot of respect in the community. And because of the respect that his father had taken the time to build in those relationships, he was often treated well. When, when they would go to their uncle's homes or go to events or come into a mosque for something special. One evening, his father was sick and wasn't able to come with him to the mosque. So he went on his own to join in with his cousins and his uncles to eat and enjoy their, their version of koinonia, right? Uh, just like he always would. And they left him at the door, and they never opened it for him to come and join the other children. He stood outside knocking. His own uncles, his own cousins, they left him outside. He went home. And, you know, heartbroken, explaining to his mother what's going on. And she was like, now you know never to take your father for granted. Because everyone seems like they love you, love you, love you when you have the big, strong man beside you. But as soon as you're at, on your own, you see how they really think about you. Now, I'm sure the next time he went with the mosque with his dad, they all were smiles and, oh, little Abdi, so happy to see you. Here, have some tabule, you know, some, something Middle Eastern. And he smiled and pretended it was okay. But in his heart of his hearts, did he really think that these people truly loved him the way that they were saying? 
No, not anymore from what he saw. Now, what kind of brother and sister in Christ are we? Right? Are we the kind that you need to sort of prove your worth or value to get that seat at the table? Or here, Here's where I'm going with this. If you think about it, every child of God still has their big father sitting next to them, right? That, that is where their value comes from. That little child, you and me, you know, oh, Pastor, Pastor Kimbrough, we don't really have any value just in and of ourselves, right? We might think, I'm good at this, I'm good at reading, I'm good at this, but not really. We're just kids in the grand scheme of it. Our value comes from God himself in the same way. Follow me here. If we're trying to love the Lord by obeying him and we see he has some child, little, little dirty child, little, little homeless, snot-nosed, annoying, whiny thing trying to come in and get food from your table and beg for bread or baklava or whatever you're wanted uh, at that particular time, out of our love for the Father, if our love is true, would we not still show that love to the child? So if you think about it, in a way, loving God's children is a way of loving God, or at least proving if that love is real, right? And I know there's a lot of people that we are not supposed to love, right? Oh, well, you, you can't love the racists. Oh, you can't love this particular minority group or this particular majority group or this particular uh, socioeconomic class or this particular political party. Whoever is the okay legal person to be offended at, right? Because in every culture, and it's different, country to country, generation to generation, as much or as accepting as we pretend to be, there's always a person it's okay to think lowly of, right? The, the acceptable little kick-me-down whipping boy, whoever they are or for whatever reason, there's always someone, even when you think you're high class. Now, I'm going to close with this quote from C.S. Lewis to tie this up. C.S. Lewis says that if man is but a creature that lives 50 to 100 years, then nations, nations countries, principalities, cultures are supremely more important than the individual. But if the word of God is true, and that man is not about 70 years, but instead an eternal, everlasting, living soul, then they are not just more important, but is incomparably more important than any nation, than any culture, than any system, than any tradition. Right? And, and the Lord says, oh, we're all one in Christ. There's no slave, no free, no Scythian or barbarian. Who here has fights with the barbarians in their house? And anyone met a Scythian recently that you can criticize? Well, these are the ones that I cannot like. No, because whatever that person is in a couple generations, 100 years, 1,000 years, we don't see Scythians anymore. We don't see barbarians anymore. Imagine how ridiculous we look in the eyes of heaven when we discount someone for something that is only real in our current day and age. That a thousand years from now, no one's even going to know the group you're talking about or the bad memories you're talking about. But what you might have done to that soul, he will, that will still be sustaining into eternity. So I encourage you, when you are tempted to be offended, when you are tempted to be impatient, when you are tempted to be dismissive, as we all will, and we probably will do it every now and then, but let's remind ourselves that we serve a God that transcends these wounds that we might feel or these walls that society builds up because we are building a better kingdom not of sticks and stones, but of lives and souls. And that is worth a little bit of awkward conversation sometimes, don't you think? Thank you.